What we're doing is wild fermentation. Homemade hard cider. You definitely gotta try this recipe. Welcome back to the fermentation adventure. This week we are making the original colonial beverage that was popular even before beer. We are making hard apple cider. Now this apple cider is the perfect way to use up all of these apples during apple season, typically in the fall. This is actually going to help you store all of this amazing apple flavor in the refrigerator or a cooler spot, perfect in time for the holidays, or you really, any time. This is a fermented drink we're gonna be making. It's all natural, and you don't need a ginger bug starter culture, but you could actually use one, that would be kind of like a different recipe, to help speed up the process. But in this case, we're actually going to be making very natural apple cider. Join us on this journey to explore the world of fermentation. If you'd like to learn how to make ferments like these, start now by clicking subscribe and hitting that bell so you don't miss a thing. Apple cider. When you hear that term, there's all kinds of terms you might have heard. Like there's apple juice, there's apple cider. There's mulled apple. mulled apple cider. There's apple wine. Um, there's apple cider vinegar. There's hard there's cider. Hard cider, which is what we're making today. So what is the difference between all of those? So really it just comes down to the refinement process and the fermentation process. So if you start at the very basics, so say you have an apple press and you press all the juice out, that juice that you have left with all the stuff in it, that's just apple cider. It's actually pretty interesting because most of the world refers to apple cider as just cider. It's just a, a fermented alcoholic beverage. Mm -hmm. it, it's only here in the Americas that it's called something different. So there's apple juice, which everybody knows you buy at the grocery store. That's when you take apple cider, which is just the pressed juice that has all of the pulp and everything in it. You filter all that off and you concentrate it and then you can store it. And that's really just apple juice. And you also pasteurize it. So it's not what we want. It's not what we want. That's what you find in the store. This is gonna be so much better than that. If you like apple juice, you're gonna love this apple cider. Oh yeah. You might have heard mold apple cider. That's where you take apple cider and you add all of the Christmas spices like nutmeg and cinnamon, cloves and, and all that stuff. And then there's hard apple cider, which has a very interesting history. Before beer was popular in the United States, there was actually apple cider and everybody drank apple cider. It was the popular thing because we grew tons and tons of apple trees. In the Northeast, I imagine, where we colonized. And of course, since we had so many apples, we would press those and everybody was making apple cider. But then the worst possible thing in the fermentation world happened. And that was prohibition. So alcohol became absolutely illegal. And some of the lawmakers, they even referred to apple cider, hard cider, as the devil's brew. They were cutting down all of the orchards. So long story short, Europeans came over and they really loved beer. Beer took hold. They were still making beer even though it was illegal. And by the time prohibition was lifted, beer took off and cider, it was just Aww. extinct almost. But time to bring it back. Time to bring it back. So now that we're done with the history lesson, let's get started. And we're gonna be making one quart of cider today, which makes two bottles of cider. Now that's if you choose to bottle. We'll talk about that later. It's actually optional. So we're going to be using though for the fermenting process, a two quart mason jar. So that's just because we wanna make sure the whole quart of liquid of apple juice fits in there and then also there's going to be some foam on top so we're going to get into that later. You just want to have a large enough vessel to fit your entire quart of liquid. And the first ingredient is apples. And there are a lot of different types of apples but we think getting the best apple cider, getting the best flavor, you need a variety of apples. And today we're going to be using a combination of jazz apples, gala apples, and a granny smith apple. The main apple that we're using for this one is a jazz apple and it's just slightly sweet and slightly tart at the same time. So it's kind of like a mix between the two. For apple cider, you definitely want sweet, but you want that little bit of a bite of the sour taste, maybe a little bit of a tannic. So the next one we're using is a gala apple, and this is almost all sweet. And to round out the flavor, just like we were saying, we're using a Granny Smith that provides a lot of the sourness. Oh yeah. Now, like we said before, there used to be all of these really tannic 
crab apple type apples. Mm. And those are really good when you ferment them for a long time. Now, I really would have loved to be able to pick these locally, but we just don't have a lot of orchards here in Florida. It's a little too hot. Um, but we do have amazing memories of picking great apples and orchards in Canada and it was around October-ish So that's really good apple picking season in like Northern America. I remember that we actually hiked up a waterfall Got to the top. <laughs> there was all of these apple trees and there was apples all over the ground. It was crazy. And it was free. Kind of ate a lot of apples that day. <laughs> so for this one quart recipe, we want one quart of juice and that roughly translates into about three and a half pounds of fresh apples. It's about eight or nine apples. Five jazz apples, three gala, and one granny smith. So that's what we're going to use today. But let us just clarify too, you can make this same recipe, this cider, the process of fermentation using any combination of these nine apples. Yeah, or you can even use the same apple if you want to. We just thought it might be fun to blend them all up and get a really good flavor. <sighs> So guess what you guys, we are using the juicer. We don't get to use it very often, but in order to get the juice out of these apples, you can do a couple different ways. We're using a juicer today. You can also use a blender. We happen to not have an apple press because I don't know why we would need an apple press here in Florida, but so this is gonna work perfectly for us. If you use a blender, you'll just need a little bit of non-chlorinated water to get it going and then a cheesecloth to squeeze out all the juice. Now we can put these apples directly whole into the juicer, but this juicer is actually going to separate the apples into the juice that we need for this recipe. And then also over here, the scraps go into like this waste bucket. But today we don't want to waste these scraps. We're actually going to use the apple pulp today because I'm going to make something special after we stop filming tonight. I'm making something. Do you know what I'm making? I have no idea. Apple pie? No. No, it's scraps. <laughs> Muffins. <laughs> that would have been possible, yeah. I'm going to be making apple cake with the oh, apple scraps. That sounds good. I know, I'm really excited. I'm getting hungry now. So since we want to use the scraps, it's important to cut or core the apple. The seeds actually have traces or small amounts of cyanide. Oh, yeah. I know, I don't know if everyone knows that. But you don't really want to eat the apple seeds. So today we're going to core the apples. It doesn't have to be perfect. I mean, these are going to be pulverized anyway. And we have, of course, compost. Make our papaya trees very happy. <laughs> Did you know that apples were not even native to North America? There was not even a single apple tree in the United States. Where'd they come from? Just people coming over from Europe and they would throw their apples on the side of the road. Crazy. <gasps> what is that called? Wild planting? Wild farming? Well, I guess nowadays it would be called guerrilla gardening. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. It's a bad one. I guess that can happen. Yeah. We kind of got that. like uh, something not so good in the middle. It's rotten to the core. So that's another good reason to cut your apple. So yeah. I better get an extra apple. Wash it in regular tap water, which here is mostly chlorinated. Dry it off before I throw it in the juicer. You also notice there's even like a little spot on there. That's not a big deal though, because we're just juicing these. Let's see what this one looks like inside. Go apple of my eye. Aww. <laughs> Let's get to juicing. Normally you would be using an apple press, which presses with pressure all of the juice out. So you can see we have our centrifugal juicer here. It spins around really quickly and you're putting a lot of force on it. So it might heat up the juice just a little bit and it could possibly pasteurize it the tiniest bit, but we still haven't had any problems with it, but we figured we would just let you know, just in case if you're looking for a type of juicer, if you want to make a lot of juice that doesn't heat it up, you would want the masticating juicer. And that just pulverizes everything and squeezes it all out. Ooh, that always makes the house smell so good. 900 milliliters. We're almost at a thousand. So we're almost at one quart. Whoa, that is a ton of foam that you have there. If you've ever seen sea foam at the beach, it's kind of like that. It's kind of sea foamy. It's a little wiggly. But actually this tastes really amazing. So there's really good flavor still in this foam. It's really just a lot of bubbles. Once those start popping, they, they become the liquid. We like to just go ahead and stir it in right now. And if it looks like it's too much foam later as it ferments, you can skim some off at that time. And now it's making me think of a root beer float. I could totally drink this right now. 
and all we really need is just over that thousand mark or around the thousand so we should be all set for the juice that we need so now let's take a look at the scraps that i'm going to be using tonight to make some cake Ooh. Ooh. kind of looks like a thick applesauce the skins are kind of still intact and that's fine i might remove big pieces of the skin to make some cake but otherwise i'm going to leave everything pretty much intact and just use it like that so now that we have all of our juice extracted from those really tasty apples, we're gonna add that to our two quart jar. We are not adding any kind of a starter. We're not adding a ginger bug. We're not adding anything, but you can add a starter at this point if you really want to. To capture the wild yeast, we are gonna have to stir this vigorously many times a day. So let's get to the fermentation process. So we've already stirred it up once today. All we have to do is cover it with like a loose top we want this to be breathable because as Paul mentioned, we really want it to be able to be exposed to the air and capture that wild yeast. So now we're ready for the fermentation process. But question is, how long should this sit on the counter? We're expecting anywhere between three and seven days. Now you'll definitely have to keep in mind, this is a wild fermentation. So it could be between three and seven days. We'll just have to find out. But we're gonna follow this through the fermentation process every day and show you what it looks like so you know what to expect when you're fermenting at home. After 12 hours, we don't see much difference, which is to be expected, but we wanna give it a good vigorous stir to help capture that wild yeast and also give the yeast some oxygen to work with. We'll continue to stir it a couple times a day. After 24 hours, there's still not much change, although the foam continues to separate and sit on top. There isn't a yeasty smell yet, so we better give it another stir to help it along. After two days, there's still no signs of fermentation, so stir, stir, stir. It's been three days, so about 36 hours, and we're starting to see something we shouldn't see. Let's take a look. Yeah, we're starting to see a little bit of these fuzzy, tiny spores that are here and there on the top. I think since it's such a thick layer, that we'll be able to just scrape that off and I don't think the mold has affected the actual cider underneath. I want to be careful not to stir in the top layer as best we can. That's probably good. It still looks kind of thick so we might have to redo this process again later. But just to make this look prettier I'm going to go ahead and shake it up with a leak proof lid. Make sure it's leak proof. Now we're going to recover and check back on it again in about 12 hours. See what it looks like on top. Maybe give it a little taste test, see if any fermentation is actually happening yet. And then we'll definitely check on it tomorrow. Wow, this has been an interesting journey. Here we are, we're trying to make cider. And it's taking a little longer than I thought it would. Here's what's going on now. Check out those bubbles getting trapped in the foam layer. The cider has also become a bit cloudier. When you shine some light on it, you can see movement from the gases being created. It's super important to keep stirring at least a few times a day to keep mold from growing. Oh, look at all those bubbles. Check it out. I don't see any signs of mold, so we're going to go ahead and stir in the top layer. After five days, it's even cloudier and very active with large bubbles. There's a lot of bubbles on top, a lot of foam looking bubbles, and we're going to stir it up a little bit. It smells pretty yeasty. Should we see what it looks like in one more day? We have a side-by-side -side comparison of our hard apple cider. This one we just made, and this one has been fermenting for six whole days. Woo! Let's see what they look like. Now you'll definitely notice this one has a ton of foam because we just made it. And we've also been skimming the foam off of this one. It smells a little bit yeasty and actually smells a little bit sweet too. Ooh, definitely a little yeasty. And you can see the bubbles coming up. That's amazing. So I think it's ready to try. It looks good, doesn't have any mold on there, mm -hmm. and uh, it's really to taste. I've got the nice glasses today. All right, before we taste it, just another thing to mention, you can keep it like this with only, you know, being a week of fermentation or so, or you can do it long-term where you rack it off, you put it in bottles, you clarify it, kind of like the, the beer making process. If you want to store it for a long term storage, you can ferment this all the way out until there's no sugar left, but it might be a couple months. There's a lot of vitamins and minerals in the sediment on the bottom there. So I'm going to stir it up. Ooh, and you can hear the fizz. Oh, <laughs> wow. 
This is incredible. It's still a little bit sweet. It's almost actually on the tangy side a little bit. I wonder if that's that Granny Smith apple. It's got to taste like a cider beer. Like truly a cider beer. This is incredible. But it's actually not beer because beer has barley and hops and all those things. I can't believe we Amazing. had homemade hard cider. Now we could actually bottle this at this stage and carbonate it. You know, normally when you have a beer and you pop it open or even a homemade soda, you pop it open and you have all those bubbles, we could do the same thing. But I think it's just so good like this. And it has a little bit of alcohol in it. Speaking of, let's go ahead and test that alcohol. To measure the alcohol, we're using what is called a hydrometer, which is this thermometer looking thing right here. What we do is we measure the specific gravity before and after and then plug it into a formula and that tells us about what percentage of alcohol we can expect from our ferments. It's pretty amazing. Home brewers use this when they make beer. We're going to use it for our ferments here. We've been using it to determine the um, alcoholic content of tapache, of watermelon soda, of blueberry rhubarb soda, you name it, ginger ale. But in this case, we do want to note that there's so much pulp, so it might affect the specific gravity readings. I think directionally speaking, it's very accurate. If you want to use one of these hydrometers yourself, check out the description below. We'll put links to everything that we use in all of our favorite gear. We do want to make sure there's no excess foam when we pour the liquid into the hydrometer for the reading. That will be very difficult to determine where the level is at. We've already taken the initial reading, so this is the final reading so we can tell how much alcohol is in here. So it looks like the reading is 1.016. Okay, let's plug it in. So we are just over 3% ABV. Yeah, after six days of fermentation, we've reached over 3%, almost 3.5%. So it's not exact, but directionally, I can tell that there's alcohol in this, and that is very reasonable for how it tastes, that it's around 3%. Yeah. Incredible. This can actually get between maybe even 5 to 7% if you ferment it all the way out. If you add yeast to it, a wine yeast, you can get it up to 10 to 12%. And there's something special called Applejack, which is a really interesting version of fermentation. It's actually distillation which technically is illegal, so don't do this at home. It's where you take apple wine and you freeze it, or you put it down to freezing temperatures, and the water in the wine freezes and floats to the top, and you keep skimming it off, and it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. It's kind of crazy. It can get up to 30%. What? So. That's Applejack. I think I'm good with 3%. Yeah, that's too strong for me. So after six days, a 3% alcohol content. Very nice. I like it. We hope you guys have loved diving into the world of homemade cider with us. If you like this video, give us a like. Don't forget to subscribe. We appreciate every one of you and we love hearing from you guys. We love all the questions and all the comments and all the messages that we get from all over the world. We really do. And if you like this video, our channel, if you like us, please share this with a friend. We really appreciate it. And you know what? Get out there and create some culture. This is so good. Mm. You gotta try this.